Hello, welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today I'm going to be talking about gauge R&R, &R, specifically the ANOVA method. Before we jump into the specifics of the ANOVA method, let's have a quick refresher about what gauge R&R &R is. And I have a whole video that goes into great depth about that if you want to check that out. But here's a quick summary of what gauge R&R &R is. ANOVA Gauge Repeatability and Reproducibility is a measurement system analysis, MSA, technique that uses an analysis of variance, that's what ANOVA stands for, random effects model to assess a measurement system. The R&R and &R in Gauge R&R &R stands for Repeatability and Reproducibility. The evaluation of a measurement system is not limited to gauge, but to all types of measuring instruments, test methods, and other measurement systems. And that definition comes from Wikipedia. Gauge R&R &R measures the amount of variability in measurements caused by the measurement system itself. This variability is then compared to the total variability observed to determine the viability of the measurement system. Because of manufacturing and testing, your measurement system is never going to be perfect, but you can evaluate how good it is using gauge R&R. &R. So you'll frequently see the term gauge R&R &R used with PPAP, Six Sigma, and other industry standards and best practices. It's also critical to use it when you're using a new tool, you're producing a new part, or you have new operators, or any other significant process change, because you want to stay as close to standard as possible. So any change in parts, systems, operators is a good reason to use gauge R&R &R to test the viability of your measurement system. And without gauge R&R, &R, it is much harder to trust the results of your measurement system because you don't know the variation that's being caused by the measuring itself. There are three types of gauge R&R. &R. The first one is known as the average and range method. So in my previous gauge R&R &R video, this was the method I used. It's not really the preferred type of gauge R&R &R and requires the variation values to be squared to have the percentages add up to 100%. They are not normally additive. More on this later. But the average and range method is the simplest method to calculate, which is why I used it in that last video. In this video, I'll be focusing on the next type of gauge R&R, &R, ANOVA, Analysis of Variance Method. The third type is EMP, Evaluating the Measurement Process. All three methods will provide similar results. So once you square for the average and range variation values, the results will be similar to ANOVA and EMP. And you can see that in my table on the bottom of this slide. A huge item of note for gauge R&R &R is that it's testing for precision, not accuracy. So a quick reminder, accuracy is how close a measurement is to the true value, whereas precision is how close the measurement of the same dimension or aspect are to each other. So if your machine keeps giving you very similar results, it is precise. But if all those results are nowhere near the true value, your machine is not accurate. So let's look at the image on the right side of the slide to really make sure we have an understanding of accuracy versus precision. If we are aiming for the center of the crosshair in the circle, image A on top is accurate and precise. Image B is precise. See how all the measurements, the dots, are clustered together? But it's not accurate because it's not on the crosshair. Image C is accurate because if you were to average all your measurements, you would be very close to the crosshair, but it's not precise. See how all the measurements are more spread out? Image D is neither accurate nor precise. So gauge R&R &R helps you determine how good your measurement system is at precision, so how close those measurements would be together. It doesn't tell you whether you're measuring things correctly. What do repeatability and reproducibility actually mean? Repeatability is the variation in measurements taken by the same person on the same instrument on the same product under the same conditions. So if you repeat that exact scenario again and again and again, how much will that vary? Reproducibility is the variation created when different operators, instruments, or laboratories measure the same product. If either of those leads to a high variation in measurement, 
so repeatability or reproducibility leads to high variation, then it's likely that something about your measurement system is wrong. Another important value is the percentage of tolerance ratio, PT ratio. Gauge R and R helps you to determine the precision of your system, which then can be divided by your tolerance to determine how much of the tolerance is being taken by your measurement system. So say your measurement setup has a typical variation of three millimeters, and the dimension you are measuring has a dimensional tolerance of plus or minus five millimeters, that means after subtracting the variation of your measurement system, you only have a wiggle room of two millimeters. How much of your total tolerance is being eaten up by your measurement system? How much of the pie is being wasted on the measurement system? That's how I view the PT ratio. And of course, you want to keep the variance due to your measurement system to a minimum. So why ANOVA? Well, the average and range method was once the preferred method of calculating gauge R&R values, due in part to its simplicity. But now, the ANOVA or EMP methods are preferred. The average and range method uses standard deviation to give a percentage of total variation, which does not add up to 100%. Ideally, all your sources of variation do add up to 100%, or very close. This makes intuitive sense, right? All your variation together is your total variation in the system. Sometimes the calculation methods can make it not exactly 100%, but you would want it to be close, whereas the average and range method was not normally close. But you can square the variation values, and these will sum to 100% and the average and range method. And as we saw earlier, the results are pretty close to the ANOVA or EMP methods. When it comes to manufacturing products, there are different sources of variation. So why your measurements could be different. There's variation due to the process itself, variation due to sampling, and variation due to the measurement system. And the ANOVA method, and gauge R&R and &R in general, focuses in on the variation due to the measurement system. The formula for total variation can be represented with the following formula. Sigma squared t equals sigma squared p plus sigma squared s plus sigma squared ms, and the sigma squared represents the variation of that respective item, and the subscripts represent the three bullets from above. So sigma squared p is variation because of the process, sigma squared s is variation due to sampling, and sigma squared ms is variation due to the measurement system. Before we jump into our example, it's good to have a grasp of what degrees of freedom means, because that is one of the terms in the ANOVA method. Degrees of freedom is the number of independent conclusions that can be drawn from the data. This relates to statistics. In statistics, the number of degrees of freedom is the number of values in the final calculation of a statistic that are free to vary but you'll typically see the formula for degrees of freedom being equal to n minus one. So your number of options minus one. And the reason you subtract one comes down to the difference between a parameter and a statistic. A parameter defines the entire population. So for gauge R and R, this would be if you could somehow measure all the parts produced in your factory, which is not feasible. A statistic is used to determine a sample from a population. So in gauge R and R, you're just measuring a few parts. That is a sample. In math terms, the variance is the standard deviation squared. And standard deviation is the average distance from the average. So on average, how far away are we from the average? Because we are using statistics, which come from a sample, it's possible that our sample will not contain the average, which means our average distance from the average will be smaller than the true average distance from the average. This is why you increase your standard deviation by using n minus 1, because if you divide by a smaller number, your standard deviation increases. I think this is much easier to understand with a visualization. So I have a timeline on the bottom, and each yellow circle represents a value in the entire population. But let's pretend that we are only sampling three values, 
which have circles around them. See how our sample average, x bar, is not super close to the true population average? Your sample average is always going to be within your sample. And if the true average is not within your sample, that means the distance from all your sample points to your sample average is going to be smaller than the distance from the true average. Think about those three circles and their distance from x bar. That's less than their distance from the true population average in the center. This is why n minus 1 is used to increase that standard deviation and thus variance value. Because there are times with sampling where your true average is outside of your sample population. So the distance is smaller. The n minus 1 helps correct for that. And the final things that are good to know before we do an example. The ANOVA method relies on something known as the sum of squares, which for our purposes will be defined as the sum of the squares of variation, where the variation is the difference between our average value of a set of values and each individual value in the set. In analysis of variance, ANOVA, the total sum of squares, helps express the total variation that can be attributed to various factors. So think about how with standard deviation, we are getting the average distance from the average. The sum of squares is an extension of that idea because we are squaring that to get a variance. And then by summing all the variation, we are understanding the variation for that area we are looking at, whether it's the operator, part, operator, part interaction, or equipment. Then we convert the sum of squares into the mean squares by dividing by the degrees of freedom. This lets you compare these ratios and determine whether there is a significant difference due to the item being examined. So once we get our mean squares, we can compare our operator caused variation versus our part caused variation or our equipment caused variation. The larger this ratio is, the more the treatments affect the outcome. So why do we use squares? To eliminate negative values. You can't have a negative variance. That makes no sense. Zero would mean all your measurements are exactly the same, a perfect system, which doesn't exist. Any positive value means you do have some variance. Let's run through a quick example to understand the ANOVA method better. I pulled this example off the website spc4excel.com. I simplified it some too, but this website does a great job of explaining this concept. So let's say for our gauge RNR ANOVA method, we are looking at three parts with three operators, and we are taking the measurement three times, which would mean there are three trials. So K equals operators, N equals parts, and R equals trials, and each of those is equal to three. And you can see the table at the bottom has all of our 27 data points. Let's start with our operator sum of squares. So the first thing to do is to get the average measurement for each operator. So for operator A, you add 3.29 plus 3.41 plus 3.64. So that is the measurement for part one across all three trials. And then you add all the measurements for part two and part three across all three trials. Then divide that by nine because that's nine total measurements. So the average measurement for operator A is 3.367. So that means on the same dimension across three different parts, measured three times for each part, this operator averaged 3.367. You do the same thing to get your average for operator B and operator C, and then you get your total average for all 27 measurements. Our total average is 3.14. Next, we need to calculate the deviation of each operator from that average and then we will square that deviation. So for operator A, that's 3.37 minus 3.14 squared, which is 0 0.0519. And for simplicity, sometimes you'll see me just show the value rounded to two decimals, sometimes three based on the image. For operator B, their squared deviation is 0 0.0008. And for operator C, it's 0 0.0653. So that is the deviation of each operator from the total average. 
the squared deviation. Then you sum the squared deviations to get 0.1180. To get the operator sum of squares, you multiply your sum of squared deviations by the sum of your parts times trials. So three parts and three trials is nine. So you multiply 0 0.1180 by nine to get 1.062, which is your sum of squares operator, SS sub O, 1.062. To get our mean square for your operator variability, you divide your sum of squares operator by K minus one, again with that minus one, which is your operators minus one. So 1.062 divided by three minus one, divided by two, is 0 0.5308. The mean square is our estimate of variance for the operator variation. The rest of our sum of squares and mean squares values are calculated basically the exact same way. You just arrange the data differently because you are trying to compare for different things. So for the operator sum of squares, we took our average for each operator across all the parts and trials, and then found the squared variation for each operator. For part sum of square, we arrange our data to look at each part and how each operator measured it across the three trials, and we take the average for each part. So for part one, it's 3.169, for part two, it's 2.149, and for part three, it's 4.099. Again, our total average is 3.14 because that's all 27 data points. You calculate the squared deviation for each part from the total average, just like we did with operators. So the part average minus the total average squared, and then you sum all three of those squared deviations to get the total sum of squared deviations for parts, which is 1.9026. Then to get our parts sum of squares, our SS sub P, you multiply that value, the sum of your squared deviations, by your operators times trials. 3 times 3, 9. So 1.9026 multiplied by 9 is 17.123, our sum of squares parts. To get the mean square for this, you divide your SSP by n minus 1, your parts minus 1. So again, with that degrees of freedom concept. So mean squares for our parts is equal to 17.123 divided by 2 which is 8.562. Our equipment sum of squares is similar to both the operator sum of squares and parts sum of squares, but it does one additional thing. So first, for each operator, you calculate the average of the three trials for each part. So for operator A, part one, the average of the three trials is 3.447. For part two, it's 2.393. So you'll end up with nine averages because we have three operators and three parts. Then you calculate the squared deviation for each trial against that operator part average. So for operator A, part one, the squared deviation of trial one is equal to that measurement, 3.29 part one trial one minus the average for operator A part one, which is 3.447. So 3.29 minus 3.447 squared. And then you do that for trial two for operator A part one and trial three of operator A part one. So you take the squared deviation of each trial for each operator part combination, which means you will have 27 squared deviations. And when you sum them all, you get 0.685, which is our sum of squares for equipment. To get our mean square for equipment, you divide your sum of squares equipment by n times k times r minus 1, which is parts times operators times trials minus 1, which is 0.685 divided by 3 times 3 times 3 minus 1, so 9 times 2, 18. So 0.685 divided by 18, which is equal to 0.0381 which is the mean square for our equipment. And without getting too much into the formulas, it makes sense that we divide it by a larger number for our mean square equipment compared to mean square operator or mean square parts. 
because we had so many more squared deviations we were summing, to get to the mean square, we're dividing by a larger number. To get our total sum of squares is very similar to the equipment sum of squares. We are still taking the squared deviation for each trial of each operator part combination. But instead of subtracting that from the average for that operator and part, we subtract it from the total average of 3.14. But we still apply that formula to each operator part trial combination to get 27 squared deviations, which sum to 18.9221. And putting it all together, knowing that the sum of squares total equals the sum of squares operator plus sum of squares part plus sum of squares operator by part interaction plus sum of squares equipment, we can now solve for our sum of squares operator by part interaction by using simple algebra to subtract all of our sum of squares values from our sum of squares total leaving us with our sum of squares operator by part interaction, which is equal to 0 0.0521. And then to get the mean square of our operator by part interaction, we divide this by 3 minus 1 times 3 minus 1, which is 4, which gives us a mean square of our operator by part interaction of 0 0.0130. Now that we have all of our sum of squares and mean squares values, let's look at the final equations to compare the sources of variation. The f value in the bottom left image is used by computer programs to determine the statistical significance of each source of variation. It helps give you your p value. And you want your p value below 0 0.05 for the variation to be considered statistically significant. If the p-value is above 0.25, then that variance is usually thrown out. Anywhere between 0.05 and 0.25 depends on the study, but because we aren't using a computer program, we won't show our p-values. The mean square values are not the variance due to the sources, but they are a step on the road to calculate those values. There are still other sources of variation, in most of these values, so we can use other equations to get down to our main variation values. The expected mean square, EMS, is used to find out what other sources of variation are present. So basically all the work we've done up to this point allows us to use these final formulas. We are looking to solve for sigma squared, which is our variation, so it represents variance due to a single source. And using the equations on this page are EMS for the equipment, operator by part interaction, parts and operators, we can rearrange the equations to solve for repeatability, operator by part interaction, parts and operators. After solving for our sigma squared values, we can now solve for our gauge R and R values. And the MSA manual published by AIAG says that the measurement system variation for gauge R and R can be represented with the formula GRR squared equals EV squared plus AV squared, which is equal to sigma squared repeatability plus sigma squared operators. And since we just calculated those values, we can solve for gauge R and R, which gives us 0 0.0956. And EV is equipment variance, and AV is appraiser variance. Another name for the appraiser? Operator. Total variance is the sum of the individual variances, which can be modeled with the formula sigma squared repeatability plus sigma squared operator by part interaction plus sigma squared operators plus sigma squared parts, which gives us 1.0447. And using this total variance, we can now calculate the percent contribution of each source of variance to the total variance. So for gauge R and R, percent variance is 9.15%. So our measuring system, what gauge R and R is looking to analyze, is contributing 9.15% of our total variance. And many manufacturers say 10% or less is good. Of course it's going to vary in your situation, so you should have a goal in mind. And I know all of this probably seemed like a lot, 
and there are a few equations that are a bit confusing at first. But if you review the process a few times before you do it at your own manufacturing facility, I'm sure you will understand it much better like I did. You take all your measurements for each operator, each part, and each trial, then you calculate the average based on what you are looking at. So it might be the operator average, it might be a part average, or it might be a total average. And then by subtracting your individual values from the average you are looking at, you get a deviation value. You square that, you sum those, and you divide those to get different values that you can then plug into the equations I listed, or you can find online, to solve for your gauge R and R values. Then you will have concrete evidence for how much variance is being contributed by your measuring system, and you can know whether that is acceptable or not based on your goals. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you now understand what gauge R and R is, why you would do it, and how you would do it using the ANOVA method. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe or like the video. I try to put out an engineering video about once a month. Have a great day.